Welcome to the Craftsman Founder Podcast, hosted by Lucas Carlson. Every week, we talk to founders, entrepreneurs, and those who've made a craft out of creating companies and enterprises. Listen every week to get ideas for starting, promoting, and growing your business. There are no shortcuts, just good old-fashioned hard work and craft. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this week's interview. This is Lucas Carlson. And hi, I'm Elliot Pepper. And this is the Crafts and Founder Podcast. This week, we're going to do a special edition because we actually have something very special going on. Uh, Elliot Pepper is launching his second book this week, and I am so proud of him and so excited about this book. Uh, I was an early reader. I got to read it early. I got to enjoy it. I got to give him some feedback. And it was really cool to be able to do that, have kind of a personal relationship with a fiction author and, and have some input on, on where uh, a book that I already was enjoying was would go uh, before it got published. And now, this week, it's very, very exciting because the book is, is coming out. So, Elliot, what's the title of the book? The title is Uncommon Stock Power Play, and it's the sequel to Uncommon Stock Version 1.0, which came out in March. Uh, got it. And uh, I know this, but if you haven't read the first one, uh, can you read the second one first, or, or should they go in order? Nope. Uh, it, it's, it's like a, an HBO series rather than CSI. So you want to start at the beginning. Um, the, the characters and the story uh, re really grow throughout the series, so you want to start at the beginning and go from there. So you were on my second episode of this podcast, and at that time you had just launched the first uh, of this series. And I was very excited about it then, and I'm very excited. It's so cool that within the time of this podcast being alive, uh, you've already written the second book. Uh, <laughs> why, why did you write the, the series in the first place? Why did you get into fiction? You know, I, you know, I find that to be a really interesting question, because I, uh, and I, I think part of it goes back to how we started talking in the first place, too, which is that... Um, I've worked in tech for quite a while and in startups, um, and I read a lot of books. Ever since I was a little kid, I've, I've read a lot of books. Um, I'm a very voracious reader. I read all genres, you know, from from uh, biography to uh, crazy advanced science fiction, right? So really across the spectrum. Um, and I just felt like there was something missing. And that missing piece was that I read so many business books by, you know, leading CEOs, leading investors that really shared a lot of best practice um, and, uh, and, and knowledge about and wisdom about how to build companies, what it's like to be an entrepreneur, what it's like working in the tech world. Um, but there wasn't much fiction um, and, and I felt like there, there was something missing there, because you could fill libraries with the nonfiction, both the good and the bad, but there's, there's something that fiction allows you to do that's a little different, that, that allows you to sort of get inside the head and experience life alongside the characters, rather than their sort of uh, accumulated lessons learned just at the end, right? And so I, I find that really powerful, and, and I love reading fiction. And I, you know, working in the startup world, as you and all of the craft and founders know, uh, it, it's it's ripe with drama. <laughs> um, so there, there's a, it's a very rich texture and canvas on which to paint. And I thought it would be such a perfect setting for an adventure. That's awesome. Yeah, there, there are movies like. Um, uh, the ones where they're set in like the 1800s and there's kings and queens and mm -hmm. all of these sorts of um, I love those kind of period historical pieces mm -hmm. but it, one of the things I've been thinking about recently is that our period doesn't have lots of mm -hmm. kings and queens it doesn't have that kind of drama but uh, it's almost as if corporations have become uh, the the kings and queen makers of, of our time uh, and startups are kind of a very intense version of that. So it's, it's kind of mm -hmm. uh, a modern uh, <laughs> version of, of those kinds of stories being retold, and I think that's really interesting. So uh, what is it that, that uh, you think is going on around the growth of uh, entrepreneurship? Do you think that, that there's 
uh, more and more entertainment growing around entrepreneurship? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's actually just objectively true, right? I mean, like, you can you can look at movies like The Social Network and uh, shows like HBO's Silicon Valley, and whatever you think of those individual shows or, you know, or movies or books or whatever, um, it's just unequivocal. I mean, there, there, is so, there are so many more stories coming out of this world right now than ever before. And I've actually heard from uh, friends who are authors in the, in the science fiction uh, space that uh, they are selling their film rights to Hollywood right now, right? So that their movies can be made, in, or their books can be made into movies. And they said that producers down there are really, really hungry for Silicon Valley stories. And I think that's just reflecting the, the larger narrative that's happening in the mainstream media today. I mean, even, even the Steve Jobs biography, Right, like Mike Walter Isaacson. I mean, that's nonfiction. But can you ever imagine, you know, like a, a geeky tech CEO, right, being and their biography being such like open to such wide mainstream readership? That's it's, it's very interesting, and I think it's a very, it's a big change that's taking place compared to a couple decades ago. So your protagonist Mara is a uh, is. Very different from you. She lives in uh, Colorado, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, and obviously she's a woman. Uh, That's right. Have you have you ever lived in Colorado? I've never lived in Colorado. No. <laughs> so how is it? Uh, you know, a lot of pe- times people write the protagonist as uh, kind of like themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, it, did did things happen to you like they happened to Mara or? Uh, or is she completely made up, or or somewhere in between? I, I mean, I think almost for any author of fiction, it's somewhere in between, right? Like, like I, I certainly didn't model Mara on myself, but every character in any book I or story I've ever written is basically some amalgamation of like my what's inside me, and then like every person I've ever met, <laughs> and maybe every experience I've ever had. So it, it's definitely informed by that. Like as an example, although I've never lived in Colorado, the book is set in Boulder, um, I spent six or seven years working in the startup world and the VC world in San Diego. And you might wonder, well, who cares? Like San Diego's a beach, Boulder's a mountain, right? So <laughs> I mean, they may not have the same geography, but what is interesting is both of them are sort of like satellite startup ecosystems to Silicon Valley. So, you know, like I, living in San Diego, I had experienced a lot in, uh, you know, on the startup side about what it's like to build a company and raise money and do all that kind of stuff in a place that isn't the tech center of the universe. And I found that really appealing to, to involve in the story as well. And that's one of the reasons why, why Boulder is highlighted. Makes sense, but now you actually do live in in the Bay Area, is that right? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, we moved here about a year ago. What what drew you to uh, to go to the tech center? Sure. So uh, my wife. <laughs> um, so uh, my wife Drea. Uh, got, so we, we took a, a sabbatical in 2013, and uh, a nine month sabbatical. We traveled all over the world. We like climbed mountains in the Himalaya. Went to all all over the place. So it was a ton of fun, and when we got back, uh, I was still doing venture work and and, the, and working with FG Press on the first book, and um, and she got a new job offer in San Francisco. So we actually moved here because of totally because of her. I, I work remotely, so I can sort of be based anywhere. But I grew up in the Bay Area, so I, I know it well, and it was sort of a return home. Has it changed anything moving back? Anything about how you feel about writing? Um, it makes me really happy to be an author. I mean, it, it's sort of funny. Like we've joked about this before, but uh, the Bay Area is going through an economic boom right now, right? Like there's an enormous amount of activity in the tech sector, and that's very exciting. I mean, like there's so many good things happening. But one of the funny things is, you know, like I started working in entrepreneurship and, and like in startups around the time of the recession, a little before. And so, uh, 
that's sort of where I like that my formative first few years were in that environment, like and not in the Bay Area. And so now being in the Bay Area, it's sort of funny. Like we'll, we'll go to an event in San Francisco, and it's almost like everybody I meet has a startup. And so when I'm like, oh, I'm an author. Like, I'm the different weird one, right? Like, if I was in, like, New York literary circles, it would probably be the opposite. But living in the Bay Area, I find it fun. <laughs> so this is your second novel that, that's coming out. What did you learn writing the first one that you could apply to your second one? A lot. So, uh, and, and, like, that's a, sort of a huge question for an author, right? That would be, like, what did you learn with your first product launch that you applied the second probably more than you can easily fit in one conversation. But, uh, you know, part of it was, and, and a lot of the lessons I learned were from advanced readers like you. Um, so actually similar to software product development, um, you know, I use beta readers, different tranches, just like beta testers, beta readers on, on versions of the book as I try to, like, iterate and make it better and, and make sure it's the best story that I can deliver to readers. And um, your input for the second book was was super useful and fantastic, and and you'll and was implemented <laughs> largely. <laughs> so uh, thank you for that. And uh, you know I, I learned a number of things. I mean, with the first book um, on the creative process side, uh, one of my challenges was that I I didn't have a deadline because I was writing for myself. Right, yeah, and this is true of almost any aspiring writer out there. Like your first book, I mean, you're just going to be sitting at your computer writing it, and the only person you're going to disappoint is yourself <laughs> if you don't finish, right? Um, and, and and then for the second book, it felt very different because now we have this story out in the world. Um, you know, there were readers who were like emailing me asking like, when is book two going to be released? And I was like, oh wow, <laughs> okay, <laughs> like this isn't just me anymore. Right, like now we've we've got a little this sort of community growing around the story, and so uh, I, I I needed to work with that. And one of the ways that helped me work with that was actually like instituting my own deadlines. Um, and uh, this is sort of counterintuitive for most authors because most authors would perhaps complain about how how pu their publisher says, "Oh, we need your manuscript done like." you know, on this date, and if the author doesn't get it done, then they get a, trigger, get a slap on the wrist from the publisher, right? Um, because they want to get it out. Like, look at George R. R. Martin. <laughs> He's, he, he takes a little while. Like, his books are fantastic, but it takes him quite a while to write them. Um, and for this, it was actually the opposite. I went to my publisher, FG Press, and said, I want the book, this book two, to come out before the end of the year because I've had so much reader outreach asking for it. And they were like, okay, I mean... All right, like write it. <laughs> and I said, okay, I'm going to get it to you on September 1st. And they're like, all right, well, if you need to change that, that's fine. But uh, how long know. did you give yourself? When did you set that deadline? I set that deadline, I think, in April, April, early May, late April, early May. Um, so I gave myself. Uh, I basically worked on the book for four months, three, really three months, because I got married in June. So we were out of the country for about a month. So, yeah. Yeah, that, that's actually a really good amount of time. Um, if Stephen King recommends that, that uh, a book, no matter what the length, shouldn't take more than three months to write. Uh, if you've never written a novel before, you might think that that's not enough time, or, or you, you might not know, have a sense uh, of, of timing. But, uh, you know, it's it, it. A book can, a novel can be written in three months. Uh, my novel, I've been working on and off on it for a year, so it's that 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 happens a lot. Usually, uh, what happens for people like me is that there will be periods of of time where you're writing every day, and then there will be periods of time where you're not. And if you just add up the periods where you are writing every day, it usually adds up to like three months, four months. Um, Although there's a uh, a big th uh, event for fiction writers every year. <laughs> Not a run -off. Yep. Uh, can you? Sp I can't even pronounce that. It's such a weird name. What is it again? <laughs> I I mean I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, but I call it Nano Rhino. Uh huh. And, so it's and the what is it? national the na na uh, what is it Nano National something Novel Writing Month, right? Yep. 
and it's yeah. November, so we're at yeah. the end. And uh, so there's this whole group of people in the world right now mm -hmm. that you may not be familiar with who are all writing an entire novel within the, the, the month of November. They're, most of them are almost done with it at this point. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, the way that they define a novel is 50,000 words, which is right. uh, rather sh on the shorter sh side mm -hmm. of things. Uh, usually people, you know, if, if you're going to a publisher, the, uh, a first novel would be somewhere in the 80 to 100,000 word length. Uh, and so 50,000 is a little less than that is the minimum for NaNoWriMo. But, uh, but there are people who go wild and write 100,000 words in, in one month. Um, and it's uh, it's pretty intense. It's pretty intense. It is. You can think of NaNoWriMo as the literary equivalent of a mud run. You know, it's yes. like when you, you sign up and, like, everybody goes together and you have to do your training and then you get to the big finish and, and dive through all the mud and climb over the obstacles and then have a beer. And that's yeah. that's sort of NaNoWriMo for, for writers. And it, is, <laughs> and it is perfectly possible to, uh, to write a book in a month. Like, a lot of people... Absolutely. They, and it can be a great book too. It does like yeah. a lot of people have this concept that you need to work on a book for a year or, or for five years for it to be any good, and uh, in some cases that's true. Uh, like um, the there are <coughs> there are some authors um, that that spend ten years to write their a single book or or uh, like like the Game of Thrones author that mm -hmm. takes a while. Uh, you know, one of the big misconceptions um, in writing is that a writer spends uh, all day, every day writing. So, can, can you tell us what what's a day in the life of Elliot Pepper? Like? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. But uh, before I dive into a day of my life, though, just to follow up on your last point, the, the the example I always give to friends when they ask about that, how long does it take to write a novel? is that almost anyone writes probably two to three books of email in a month, right? So it, it, it really, you know, it's not this insurmountable goal. It's just what you're writing about. Instead of writing about, you know, the, the project you're supposed to deliver, you're making up a story out of thin air <laughs> um, or, or writing a nonfiction piece, right? Um, so, yeah, I mean... My days are probably less, I, I don't know, when I read interviews with other writers or listen to podcasts with other writers, they often have like extremely organized, or at least they present an extremely organized creative process. I, actually, I recently interviewed uh, Ramez Nam, who's a famous techno thriller writer, and he runs his own writing process like a software development project. So he has spreadsheets that literally have, you know, have cells that cover every beat, basically, right? And, like, you add them together, and it covers scenes and chapters and the whole book, and it's all mapped out with calendar and timeline, and he knows what he's supposed to be writing when. It's really impressive. And uh, I'm not like that. <laughs> I, uh, my creative process is much more scattershot. I, I try. I've been experimenting with different things. So, for example... I, I tried for a while to say, I'm going to write every day for this amount of time, right? Like, uh, you know, three hours at, you know, from, from 8 to 11 a.m. every day or whatever it was. And that lasted for three or four days and then totally fell apart because, you know, I had a call or a meeting or I needed to do something. And then I said, okay, who cares about the time? You know, I'm going to write two to 3,000 words a day. And, and when, however long it takes... And, uh, and whenever I get it done, but, like, it's going to happen, right? And that didn't work. And then I said, okay, well, maybe it's just that that was too short-term. What if I write 20,000 words a month, right? And, like, th there we go. We'll do that. None of that has worked for me. Like, I end up just sort of, like, writing when I can build out time blocks to write. And I've, I've found some rough rules of thumb that help. So number one is if I write for less than an hour, in a given time period, I don't really have time to warm up. And if I write for more than three hours in a given day, you know, like consecutive, um, my brain melts, <laughs> right? So somewhere in the middle is that magic point where I get my rhythm going and I'm productive. And then, uh, so if I have that, and that's sort of true on the word front too, 
if I write less than a thousand words in a writing session that's like of a decent length, I'm sort of disappointed in myself. And if I write more than three thousand, you know, I, I I deserve a cocktail or or what you know or a truffle or something, right? Um, and then uh, and and then so I combine that. So now it's like. I know the rough amounts of time and effort it takes me to be productive. And then I have to make sure that I'm listening to, like, instrumental music so that I don't have, like, other stories that are happening in my brain thanks to the lyrics. Um, but I don't have, like, Twitter open, right, so that I can easily distract myself. I usually open a new desktop, on, on, you know, on my computer and, and just work in there and make Word full screen. And then I need a deadline. Because more than, you know, I don't need the whole product development milestones laid out like Hermes does, but I do need to know when I'm going to, you know, when my goal is to have the story done. Because then inside, I have an intuitive feeling for where I am in the story, where the characters are in their own arcs and their own journeys, and whether that really feels like the climax is going to happen. That makes a ton of sense. Um, yeah, I think that that goes to show that for for you and for a lot of authors, they spend one to three hours a day writing. Uh, and I think even like famous authors, like Stephen King, only spends three or four hours a day writing. He writes every single day for three or four hours, but then the other the half of his day, he usually does the the first part writing. The other half is is just relaxing and reading stuff and living Things life and uh, for some for Stephen King that's fine uh, for somebody who needs to make a living there's actually I know programmers who write on the side and they write for one hour two hours every morning before they go in for work mm -hmm. um, I personally write at night because that's my quiet period I've got two small kids and uh, I can't wake up two hours before they do because that, that would be humanly impossible. <laughs> but I can stay up two hours later than everybody else does. That's something, as a programmer by nature, I'm a night owl, so uh, I, I tend to write at night, which is a little against the grain. A lot of uh, writers write in the morning when they're fresh, but I feel freshest to write at night. But it's something that uh, a lot of people think if I'm a writer, then that's what I have to do for my full-time job. It's what I have to spend all of my waking hours on. And uh, many, many writers, many uh, famous, well-known uh, people uh, have just write for part of their day, and they, they even have jobs, day jobs, uh, where, where, pe where they can do menial stuff. Usually... Uh, for somebody writing, especially fiction, their day job doesn't involve fiction or, or writing uh, at all because, you know, it's kind of like there's there's a certain number of words you can write and then <laughs> it just all goes downhill. And if your day job is writing for a newspaper and you're trying to write a book, yeah. it's kind of like That's you're crazy. overtaxing that muscle. So a lot of uh, people trying to write a novel, they might work in a flower shop or they might work in manual labor, mm -hmm. construction, uh, uh, but but it's you know you can really it's whatever works for you and and people who uh, haven't written a book they don't realize that you know if you can carve out like if you can uh, not watch one hour of TV or two hours of TV at night that's you a book right you could write a novel in uh, a couple months yeah that's absolutely right you know one of the things that I've always found very interesting is that I meet so many people who want to write books. They say they've always dreamed of doing it. But that, that dream often goes unfulfilled. And one of the beautiful parts about wanting to write a book is that there are actually so few things standing in your way, right? Like if you want to climb Mount Everest, you either have to pay a ton of money to have people carry you up, or you have to do a lot of training to get good enough to go up yourself. But with writing a book, you have all the tools you need at your disposal right now, and the only question is making that time. And as you say, the time commitment is less than most people think. I mean, even very famous authors like uh, Hugh Howey, you know, he wrote his first, what, eight or nine novels, and he was working in a bookstore, like, yep. as a clerk, yep. right? And, and he would write them during his 45-minute lunch break. 
like that's when he made the time, right? And and as you say, I mean, like cancel Netflix and write your damn book, right? And, <laughs> and, uh, and, and then you can go back to Netflix afterwards and you'll have achieved your dreams. <laughs> and that's cool um, for nonfiction too. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, th I think that, that that applies just across the board. Um, you know, it's one of those things where there's, there's sort of, I mean, there is the occasional crazy person and crazy, like, I mean, in a good way, like crazy productive person. Like, I know you know Michelle Miller who wrote The Underwriting, and she uh, would write, like, eight hours a day. And I don't even understand how that's humanly possible, but she sort of would, like, do that for a short period of time, and then it would all be written, and she would, I guess, like, crash, right? Like, yep. but... Um, but, but for most of us, you know, almost, I mean, and you would be surprised. You would be surprised if you have books you love, right? Maybe a mystery series that you've read for a long time. Maybe a, maybe a nonfiction author that you've read a few books on. Um, or, or whatever, whatever it is that you like to read. You'd be really surprised at that author's day. Because unless they are Stephen King or a few other really big name authors, it's highly likely they have a day job. And yep. that writing might be to them like a hobby, and maybe it's and like I mean again that's it in a good way too. Like writing is a hobby for Stephen King; he loves it. That's why he does it, and it happens to pay him a lot too. Um, but a lot of the mid-list authors who I love and read, um, they have day jobs, and and writing does make money for them, but it's not like that's that's not their primary source of income, and and they make time in the rest of their life to to, to create those books. Yeah, so that raises the question, do you have a day job? I do, I do. So, yeah, um, I, 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 uh, I advise a number of technology startups, a, a few, two or three at a time, um, and they're always tech entrepreneurs, usually between the seed and sort of Series C stage on financing and strategy. I used to work as an entrepreneur in residence for a venture capital firm, and so uh, I was like a drop-in operator where I would go into all these different startups and help them accelerate past their next growth milestone, and uh, and that's what I continue to do independently. So that that's what I'm doing when I'm not writing. Cool. So uh, tell us kind of um, the the elevator pitch for the story, and start with book one. If people haven't read the first book, what what is what is Uncommon Stock about? So Uncommon Stock is it's a tech startup thriller, and it's about a pair of college students in Boulder who drop out of uh, CU Boulder to start their first company. And um, their company is called Mosaic, and they're building a piece of software that's basically spell check for financial fraud. So they can apply their analytical software to, let's say, the data that Bank of America has, right? Like, like enormous, big, huge piles of financial data and transactions from around the world. And Mosaic goes through and using sort of some advanced machine learning algorithms highlights unusual activity where fraud might be evident, right? And as you can imagine, um, once this product sort of gets released into the world, um, it it causes it stirs up some trouble, and they sort of get uh, they get caught up in a whole money laundering conspiracy with a bunch of super shady investors, and and it goes downhill. From Got it. And what's the second one about? So the second one, I mean, that's actually the pitch probably for the whole series. So it's a, it's a trilogy. Um, in the second book, uh, the Mosaic, their company, is now growing. So now if the first book, you can imagine that they were a garage startup, right? You know, they were working out of a coffee shop, just the two of them, and trying to get their feet under them. Now in book two, that is accelerating a lot. So now they, they have an office, they have a team, and they're, they're really building much more for scale. They're starting to work with some large clients, and in, in, this, in, in this story, it's you know, financial, like banks, right? So they're starting to work with these big clients. They're wrestling with all of those tough challenges that entrepreneurs face as they move from sort of just getting started into that middle, like, high-speed growth stage, and at the same time, the stakes are rising for the thriller part of the story because the conspiracy that they started to get involved with is getting darker and a lot more opaque. 
That sounds awesome, and, and it is awesome. Both books are really good. Uh, I enjoyed, uh, one of the things I enjoyed about the first book is how you weave together uh, great startup advice as part of the story, and one of the things I liked about the second book is that it, it had more thriller aspects, so it was, it was kind of more of a page turner. So uh, anybody that is out there that is halfway remotely interested in, in startups and likes to read, absolutely pick up the book. If, if you pick up the book and you want to get in touch with Elliot yourself, Elliot, how do you get in touch with you? Um, easiest way to do it is just find me on my blog, ElliotPepper.com, E-L-I-O-T-P-E-P-E-R.com. I'm on Twitter. It's just, you know, at my name, Elliot Pepper. And I've got a, a great mailing list where I share a bunch of uh, interviews like this that, that we do, um, as well as updates on new releases and, and any time I, I write something fun. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time, and it's been great hearing more about this process, and uh, look forward to, to seeing how the launch goes. Thanks so much, and uh, I think that the, the book owes you a lot for all of your input on the beta reading side, so thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to the Craftsman Founder Podcast with Lucas Carlson. If you like what you just heard, we hope you'll pass along our web address, craftsmanfounder.com, to your friends and colleagues. Be sure to check out our archive section on our website for previous podcasts. This has been a Craftsman Founder production. Join us next time for another edition of the Craftsman Founder Podcast.